Today, in honor of National Latinx Heritage Month, we are so excited to introduce you formally to Cynthia Rivera, one of our newest law school associate consultants. Latinx Heritage Month runs from September 15th through October 15th, so we thought this would be the perfect time for you to learn a little bit more about Cynthia, why we're so excited to have her here as part of the Barrier Breakers team, and why she is so excited to help you on your law school application journey. Now, for those of you who are new and you don't know who I am, my name is Sydney Montgomery and I am the founder of S. Montgomery Admissions Consulting, a brand underneath the Barrier Breakers faith-based nonprofit, where we specialize in working with first-generation and minority law school applicants. And today, we are so excited to have Cynthia Rivera with us. Cynthia is a proud Puerto Rican mother. She is also a first-generation college graduate from Cornell University, where she got her BA in history. While at Cornell, she was a student recruiter in the admissions office. She got her JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, and while she was a student at UVA, she actually worked in admissions at the admission task force. After she graduated from UVA Law, she worked for the Department of Labor for a little bit. She worked for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Washington, D.C., and then transferred later into financial services. It was there that that love of admissions came back, and Cynthia started working as a reader for UVA. She was reading files and essays of applicants just like you, hundreds of applicants, really where she learned and gained her expertise in admissions. She eventually pivoted to being a law school consultant full-time, and has since joined the Barrier Breakers team so that she can work more closely with other first-gen and minority applicants like herself, like me, like many of you, so that she can help you become the best lawyer that you can be. So we are so excited to bring up Cynthia. Thank you so much, Sydney, for having me. I really appreciate it. Cynthia, I've known you for a few years now at this point. And so I know that when we first started talking, you know, I never could have imagined, I never could have dreamed that one day we'd get to work together. So I'm just so thrilled that you're here and I'm thrilled that our students get the benefit of all of your expertise and also the benefit of being able to work with someone who again has that first gen minority experience, especially someone from the Latinx community. So thank you so much for being here, for answering the call. So the first thing that I wanted to talk just a little bit about so that students can get to know you is your own journey. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a first-generation Puerto Rican student? What was it like going to college, going to law school? What were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome? I would have never imagined being able to attend the colleges that I attended. As you mentioned, I am a first generation. My family there worked as mechanics. My father was a taxi driver. My grandfather was a farmer. So there was no one really around me to explain to me how the college process worked. I grew up in a town where I had no access to a library. I lived in the rural area and my mom will sometimes uh, take public transportation to go and, and help me with school supplies, buy books. She was very supportive of education and for me that was the greatest motivator. And she gave me everything that she could. However, I didn't have dinner conversations at the table about how a college works, you know, what, what office hours entails, what does it mean to have a large lecture, what does a TA do? I didn't even know what a bursar's office was. I didn't know how to dress for an interview. But what I did have was the motivation from my family to go after my goals, as they always said. So being able to study at uh, University of Virginia Law School was something that I had never imagined. I wanted to become an attorney. I wanted to be a bilingual attorney that was important to me. And I wanted to be a bridge. There were a lot of challenges. I would say the biggest challenge was this idea of feeling like I, I didn't belong. But I did meet wonderful people. I had wonderful mentors who believed in me. And I hope that I can do the same for others. And I know that you can do the same for others. It's really inspiring every time I hear your story because I think there are so many students who see themselves in your story who might be in a rural area, who might have family members who don't know a lot about higher education. I know my parents didn't know a lot about the college process, but to, you know, I didn't grow up in a rural area. So to have those challenges, but also not have some of those structural or systemic supports around you because of geography or just because 
because of the resources around you is an added hurdle. And I know that when you're able to share your story, there's so many students that, that can see you and see the progress that you made. And it's not just getting to the schools. I mean, you went to fantastic schools. You went to Cornell undergrad. You went to UVA law. But you also had a really great career. I'd love to talk a little bit about your work at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which really helps to prevent employment discrimination. And I know a little bit about that because my dad actually did some work in the Equal Employment Offices, kind of in the government through the Navy. My parents are military. And so that's always been something that's been really important. The military has, you know, a lot of opportunity for growth in some areas when it comes to that. And so I would love to talk to you a little bit about your work at the EEOC and how that experience in preventing employment discrimination or thinking about discrimination issues shaped your understanding of the importance of diversity in the legal field and your your passion for continuing to create diverse environments. Working at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was a dream of mine. And for me to be able to work at the Office of Legal Counsel, that was basically the in-house office for the federal agency itself. And our job was to make sure that the agency was able to operate. We ensure that our attorneys in all of our field offices were supported. For me to be able to work alongside so many amazing people who day to day believed in the mission of the agency was extremely humbling for me and extremely empowering. For me to see change on a daily basis, to see the public believe in the agency and its mission, it was an incredible experience. And to see also the attorneys in the fields, one of my jobs was also to visit some of our offices. It was incredible. For them, it was not a job, it was a mission. And they realized that so many employees, so many people rely on their work. I became more aware of the circumstances and the sad circumstances surrounding many of our workers, many of our employees, many of our citizens. And it also gave me great joy and hope to see that there are laws protecting all of us. And it also made me aware of the fact that we have more to accomplish. We definitely have a lot more to accomplish with the law, but that is, I think, why the work that we're doing here at Barry Rigger and the work that students are doing on their applications to increase representation in the legal field, I think that's why that matters so much. I want to talk a little bit about admissions. I know that you read for UVA as an admissions reader before you transitioned into consulting full-time. That gives you definitely a little bit of an inside perspective into institutional priorities and how they're thinking and viewing different law school applicants, their essays and their materials. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've learned from your time at UVA? Any insights or things that you wish students knew that you learned from your time at UVA as an admissions reader? I think that one of the things that I learned was the importance of being genuine. Hearing the committee itself discussing how important it was for them that the applicant displays not just the intellectual curiosity and capacity, but that this person is genuine. I would say that that was their number one criteria. It was very, very, very important. I wish that applicants knew the importance of being themselves, that they do not need to pretend to be someone else, that they can, of course, as long as they use the proper tone and that they're professional, that is okay to bring their experiences to the table and that they should not be embarrassed. For me as a first generation, that was important to hear because many times as a first generation or perhaps as a person who lived in a rural area or as low income individual as myself growing up, you, you have a sense of shame. And to know that, that institutions value who you are is very important to me. So I always tell my students to wear your first generation label or, or experience, your low income experience, wear it with honor because it does matter in your application. It does matter that you're genuine and it does matter that you're true to that experience. And so taking what you've learned from your time as a reader, what would you say motivated you to make that jump to consult full time? What do you hope to be able to accomplish in your work with students or how do you hope to inspire them? Just what motivated you to, to make that jump, that career change really from practicing law? So one of the reasons was as a reader and once you're in, in the admissions process or, or I should say in the admissions office, you get to see the application complete. And there were so many instances 
where I would look at an application and, and hope that the applicant would have done something differently or that the applicant hadn't done something. And I always wonder, wow, if I could only get to this applicant before they hit the submit button, would that be possible? You know, would I be helpful? And that's when I decided to go to the other side. And what were some of those things? Like, can you tell me what some of those common mistakes were, the common challenges maybe faced by students that you saw through your time as a reader at UVA or just in general from your time working with students full time? What are some of those common mistakes that you see students make in their essays and their, or their applications as a whole? One of the mistakes actually that I saw was in the way that many of them did not use the opportunity of submitting an addendum. And they would probably hoped or expected the admissions officer to make an inference. And that's something that I always tell students, do not let the admissions officer make an inference because they, they are trying to get to know you, but they don't know your whole story. And there were many students that if you look closely in their transcripts, if you look closely in their resume, they were working two or three jobs. And that's why they couldn't probably perform at the level that they could have performed. And I really wish that they had expressed that in an addendum rather than allowing the admissions officer to make an inference or probably not even see it because they do have to read rather quickly. So that was one of the things that I saw, the lack of use of an addendum, sometimes the misuse of an addendum, not using the appropriate tone or not including relevant information. Other mistakes that I saw was sometimes not being thorough and submitting the wrong name to the wrong law school. Yeah, that, that's always the worst. Like, you know, Harvard Law School is my number one school. Oh, too bad this is going to Columbia. This is an aside, but I had a student, I used to do interviewing for Princeton for college admissions way back in the day. And she was so sweet. She was so sweet. And I didn't hold it against her. I think someone might have, but I didn't. And I remember I asked her, why do you want to go to Princeton? And she was like, because it's like Harvard. And Harvard's my dream. <laughs> I was like, oh. That was the wrong answer. <laughs> Don't ever say that to anyone else again. But you know, we see it. We see it sometimes sure. in, these, in these essays, right? So yeah, I can definitely attest to that being a common mistake. I want to speak a little bit about, like I said, this is National Latinx Heritage Month. I think it's really great. You are our first full-time Latina hire here at Barrier Breakers. Now, granted, we're not a big company, so <laughs> there will be a lot of firsts still. But you are our first full-time Latina hire, and for that, I am so, so excited excited. I'm also going to take a small moment just to plug that as a reminder, Barry Breakers is a nonprofit organization. So if you would like to continue to support our work, please feel free to look at our website, barrier-breakers.org backslash donors. We would love to have your support. But I'd love for you, Cynthia, to talk a little bit about what it means, right, for you, Puerto Rican, to be a part of this process, to be part of diversifying the legal field. We talk a lot about the fact that only 2% of lawyers are Black women, only 5% of lawyers are Black, but only 5% of lawyers are Latinx, right? The statistics are pretty much the same. We know that the Latinx population in this country is growing rapidly and the legal profession is not necessarily, well, not necessarily, it's just not representing the makeup of this country as that continues to change and as the demographics continue to change. So what does it mean for you as Puerto Rican, as a Latina woman, to be in this role, to be working with students? And what message do you have? Thinking, like, talk directly to the Latinx students that are listening. What message do you have for them as they embark on this journey? That's such an important question. And it's unfortunately a really serious issue, the lack of representation. But at the same time, I have hope. And to be able to work on a daily basis with our future attorneys, it's just not just a privilege, but again, it's just a, an honor to be able to take part of their journey. I think that in order for us to change the landscape, in order for us to have some sort of impact, we need to encourage legal representation. We need to make sure that our voices and our issues are being heard. And I tell all of those who are thinking about attending law school, Please do. We need you. Absolutely. We absolutely need you. And I just have so much faith in each one of you. Y quiero decirles a los aplicantes, a los solicitantes Latinx, que sigan hacia adelante. Aunque el camino sea difícil, por favor, 
sigan adelante porque sus voces son necesarias. Necesitamos abogados más que nunca. Hoy día, DACA, los derechos civiles están siendo violados. Nuestros derechos constitucionales están bajo ataque. Así que yo los exhorto a que, por favor, continúen con sus sueños porque necesitamos más abogados como tú. Continue your, your path, even though it's hard, because we need your voice. We need you to become an attorney to safeguard our constitutional rights because the DACA and civil rights are under attack and we really need your voice. I ask you to continue with your dream. So you've been here for a couple of months now, actually. So you've been here since June and you've gotten to see a little bit of how we work. You have your own students. You have quite a number of students that you're working with in both the boot camps and the one-on-one -on -one private consulting. What do you think makes Barrier Breakers, makes the work that we do unique and different from other law school consulting firms? We are the only ones who are offering this type of service. And it's a type of service that it's so much needed. And this is something that I talk about a lot with applicants and, and students. We did not, as first generation, low income, we did not have these conversations at the dinner table. And I feel that these students do not have access to this information. And for us to be able to bridge the gap and be able to have these conversations with our students and be able to talk to them about, hey, this is how the application works. This is how the application process works. This is what's expected of you. For me personally, to see how relaxed all of a sudden they feel, how they feel so grateful because they now have this information that they never had before. When I see that sense of awareness, it means everything to me. So I am so excited to be able to not just work as a consultant, but to have a mission as a consultant. And I thank you for that. Well, I thank you for being here. And, you know, one of the things that I remember you telling me, you can't fail, right? There are too many students that need your work. We're we're thankful by the end of this year, Barrier Breakers will have helped about 7,000 students through the college and law school application process. But for me, there are still so many more, right? Uh, certainly, we're not helping 7,000 a year. Like, you know, that'd be great. One day, one day. But, you know, total since we've been doing this and I've been consulting since 2012, so about 12 years. But I, I think about it, it's still just such a small percentage of even the BIPOC students, the first gen and minority students that are applying, we're only touching a small percentage. And so for me, you know, when you told me, Sydney, you can't fail like those words, they really resonated with me because it's not about me. Right. And it's one of the things that really led us to becoming a nonprofit. It's not about me and you know, us having this business. It's about the students and making sure that thorough one on one personalized support throughout the entire process. You know, we provide support throughout students time in law school completely for free. That is available to them. High quality service. People like you who have worked in admissions, people that have years of experience that can give this kind of high quality, high touch advice available to students on a sliding scale. If you have a fee waiver, it's 80% off and we have some things that are coming that are going to make it even more accessible. And so I'm so happy that you're here to help us to make sure that we continue to expand, we continue to serve more students and we continue to meet them where they're at. Now, I do want to ask, you know, you were a reader at UVA. UVA is a top law school, right? It's in the T14. And not that rankings are everything because they're definitely not. But what are some ways that first gen minority students can be competitive, especially thinking about our students, right? What are ways that they can be competitive to get to those top schools when they come from a background that might be different from, you know, the typical student that people might be thinking of? I would say that the number one thing that they can do is not to be afraid or embarrassed to ask for help. And I know that many of us with backgrounds that sometimes we're embarrassed about that. Sometimes we feel that we just don't want people to know that we don't know. And I, I went through that and it's not easy to overcome that. I, I just didn't want to be the person who didn't know. But at some point I did have to overcome that sense of embarrassment or that sense of not belonging and just ask for help. You can ask your peers, you can ask a professor, you can go to the Dean of Students. They are there to help you because they want you to succeed. 
a happy alum. It's, it's something that's very important to your law school. So I would say don't don't be embarrassed to, to ask for help. Also try to find mentors who will help you. In my case, it was the, the Balsa Association, the Black Law Student Association at the University of Virginia. They were everything to me. My mentor was the vice president of the organization, and she was the one who taught me how to interview, how to dress. I had no idea. I thought that going to an interview and dressing nicely meant to wear your church dress because that's the environment that I grew up in. That was a nice dress. Little did I know that I had to learn so much and I owe everything to her and to many other mentors who took the time to really advise me. So I would suggest surround yourself with a great network, a support group, find yourself a good study group and don't be embarrassed to ask for help. You have to ask for help. You can't do this alone. There are certain things that have gotten us this far, right? We're resilient. That's something that I always tell first gen. We are resilient and that has gotten us to this level. But at this level, you've got to ask for help. I absolutely agree. I am a big believer in closed mouths don't get fed. <laughs> and people ask me all the time, even about business, like, They'll say, Sydney, how did you get where you're at? How did you grow? And I always say, I ask for help. I listen. There's a lot that I don't know. And I'm grateful for people who gave their time and their experience to help me. And there's still so much in life that I need help with, right? That I ask for help. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that you can do as a first-gen student, as a minority student, is to not be too proud to say what you don't know, because you will learn. And you'll learn faster if you ask for help than if you try to do it on your own. That is the quickest way to learn is to really ask for help. But Cynthia, we're, we're almost at the end. This has been such a fantastic interview. I hope our students have enjoyed getting to know you. I wanna help them get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. You know, I know that you're a mom of two awesome boys and you do things in your in your free time. So what do you do when you're not busy saving the world, consulting law school students, creating the future? What do you like to do? How do you rest and recharge and, and fill your cup so that you can pour into others? Yes, absolutely. So I do Zumba. I love dancing. I love music. I like going to the gym and just going to dancing classes. I like to go on bike rides with my kids. And I also like to go to the farmer's market and read. And I like to get together with my friends. That's that's important. Just to have a cup of coffee. It's always good to recharge and keep those relations strong. Because ultimately, the most important thing that matters are your relationships. Relationships with others, relationship with your brothers, with your sisters, with your neighbors, with your significant others, professors, etc. I think that's really important to me. And that's something that I have learned as I had gotten older. I definitely agree with that. I think relationship building is so important and not just for networking. I know that we usually talk about it, but for like what matters in life, it's family, it's friends, it's community. I was listening to a talk today and someone said the greatest form of communication is communion communion with others, being in a relationship with others. It's the greatest form of communication and that really struck a chord with me. And relationship building is what we're about here even, right? Like I always tell students the work that we do here, it's not transactional, it's relational. We like to relationship build with you. You know, we care about each of the students that we work with here. I joke around and say, you can never get rid of us. That is actually true. <laughs> because we want to we want to continue to support you we want to give you a mentor your first year of law school we want to like give you resources your second and third year if we can if we have connections we're happy to help you with your job search we have people that come back and speak on panels but that's the way they like to be right i like to build community because as our community grows then each person in the community gets stronger because they get connected to a larger network of people and as first generation as minority students that's important right i want when you come to work with us that you're immediately connected to hundreds of people, that you're immediately connected. Oh, I'm gonna go to the school that I've never heard of in this town that I've never been to. Hey, but there's a couple of people in the Barrier Breakers community who are already there, who are like welcoming me, right? Like a welcome squad. That's what I wanna grow to. That's that's my goal and my vision is that no matter where you are as a first gen minority student, you actually always know someone because you've been in this community with us. 
So thank you for mentioning community. It's super important. And thank you in general for just sharing a little bit about you. I know that our students deeply appreciated it. If you are interested in working with Cynthia, you can. We are so thrilled to have Cynthia here. And so Cynthia, I just want to say thank you one more time. Thank you for being here. Is there anything else you want to say? I just want to say that it has been a pleasure for me to be here. And for me, it has been another dream come true to be able to work with you and the amazing team at Barrier Breakers. And I'm looking forward to working with many more applicants. It's been a pleasure to be here and not just have a job, but to have a mission. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. We really appreciate that. As always, make sure that you share this video or share this podcast episode. If you're not already, make sure that you're subscribed to our YouTube channel, that you're following us and subscribe to Break Into Law School podcast. Sharing is caring. Share it with a friend. Like, comment, and review. Like I said, we're celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. And so let us know how we can support you. Let us know in the comments. If you have any questions, you can submit them to bit.ly slash break into law school. And we will see you soon.